So here we are at the final two episodes of the season, and are they any better than the shite that preceded it? How about no? Episode 7 finally explains what the Dean's motivations are, and they are outright retarded. She has conflicting goals that cannot work together, and yet she fails to recognise this. I'll go into why exactly she is such a dumb character later on, but this is a major problem of the show, which is that it lacks a strong antagonist to serve as a focus for the story, because without one, the characters lack any sense of agency, and instead all they end up doing is sitting around crying about their feelings waiting for the next event to happen. This absolutely kills the pacing and makes the show a chore to watch. Now the writers have had almost 8 hours to flesh these characters out, giving them clear motivations and character arcs to follow, but what we have ended up with are shallow, narcissistic assholes with no personality. First off is Marie, who wanted to be popular so she could find her long-lost sister, but in episode 2 his sister refused to speak to her, so if nothing else to do she just kept trying to be popular because the writers have no idea what to do with her character. She also gets into a hasty and poorly developed relationship with Jordan, and they lack any chemistry. That's it, that is Marie's entire personality and character arc for the show, and she is the main character. She is so irrelevant to the plot that she could have easily been cut out and nothing would have been lost. Next is Andre who fucked his best friend's girl behind his back and after he died he wanted to figure out why he killed himself. A very simple motivation, but in episode 3 out of the blue he just wants to become a real hero. What causes this change? Don't know, one day he just woke up and decided that this is his new motivation because most of the characters flip flop depending on whatever the writers need them to do. We then have Emma whose main character trait is that she loves cock and she hates being ridiculed either online or by her mother. Her arc, if you can call it that, is she gets into a relationship with Sam and nothing else. So just like Marie, she is barely a character. Also, being in a relationship is not character development, especially when they run into it as fast as these wankers do. Next up is Sam, who is a mentally ill test subject that constantly escapes his poorly protected cell, before eventually going on to fuck Emma. He, just like Kate, has a massive motivation change in episode 7, after attending one town hall meeting, and basically turns into a knockoff homelander in one episode. Then there is Kate, who has been doing the Dean's dirty work because she adopted and gave her pills all her life. Now that's fine enough, but later on in episode 7 she just becomes a soup supremacist out of fucking nowhere and wants to kill the human race. Well that's just silly. Silly yes. Idiotic yes. Last and least we have Jordan who believes that it does not get the recognition it deserves because everybody hates the fact that it is trans or by gender or whatever the fuck it calls itself. That's basically Jordan's entire personality. Outside of that, in one episode, it goes from hating Marie to being in a relationship with her. Again, this poorly developed and rushed relationship is not a substitute for a character arc, but all of these hookups are only here because without them, the characters would have nothing to do. Wow, that's really... really boring. Outside of getting into pointless relationships, none of them grow or develop in any meaningful manner, and none of them have anything more to them than a surface level personality trait, such as Jordan being trans or Emma being a sad whore, so it's no surprise that with such shit characters the show turned out to be fucking awful. Anyway, for the final time, let's run through the plot. Episode 7 starts off with the Dean trying to make the virus, originally designed to control soups, into a plague to kill them all. But the scientist threatens the Dean, saying that he is going to inform her bosses about the plans, and this is her response. I don't know, tell me. What would happen if you told Vaud you created a virus that kills soups? Well, as the director of this facility and the one ultimately responsible for whatever happens under your watch, you would be the one to be punished, not him. And him coming to Vought, telling them that you have gone rogue, would prove to them that he is loyal to the company, making this an empty threat if ever I saw one. And why would Vaught kill him? His expert knowledge in making viruses to control soups is exactly why they hired him in the first place, and he has already proven that he can do so, so there is no reason to dispose of him. But for some reason, this empty threat is enough to make him compliant. That's retarded. The Dean then receives a call from Kate to come home, as she has stopped taking her medicine. 
So until she gets home, the group just hang around a cafe and Jordan goes outside to talk to Marie, saying it doesn't trust Kate. Marie then goes on to lecture Jordan about mansplaining. And you gotta stop turning into a dude when you want to make a point to us. <sighs> Jordan goes on to say that they should break into the Dean's office and get some evidence, as it already has her keycard. But Marie says that nobody will believe any evidence they collect for one simple reason. You think they're gonna believe a black girl in a bi-gender Asian soup over Vought? Why are you the way that you are? So the solution to the problem that Marie presents is that the racists will not listen to them, but they will listen to the Arab AOC. That doesn't make any sense! Both of them go on to sneak into the Dean's office and they find a document which has all the information about the crashed flight caused by Homelander. Turns out that her family were on the flight and now the Dean wants to kill every suit because of what Homelander did. By that fucked up logic, why doesn't she want to kill all the Muslims as well, as they were the ones that hijacked the plane in the first place? They caused the whole situation, and if Homelander never showed up, I highly doubt that they would have landed the plane peacefully, considering the history of such incidents. Now, for those of you saying this is stupid, well, it's just as retarded in a leap of logic as killing every soup for the actions of one. But fuck it, logic isn't something these characters are capable of. Now, Marie and Jordan don't know about the virus she is developing, so what brilliant piece of writing are they going to pull out in order for them to learn about it? Well, the scientist just walks into the room by himself and starts blabbering on about it. Sure, why not talk about the top secret plague that if anybody finds out you are working on, you and your whole family will get murdered, probably in a brutal fashion. This is stupid! So before the Dean returns home, she decides to meet up with Mallory, and it's here I thought, okay, she is working for the CIA. That is how she is getting all of this highly classified information, both on Tech Knight and on the crashed plane. But no, she is just some woman who by herself managed to infiltrate Vought and create a plague that will kill every soup. The meeting with Mallory is just the Dean asking for help in finding soups to kill. If the virus you are making is going to be airborne, then it's obviously going to go everywhere. So why bother tracking soups as they'll get infected one way or another? This is all just a bad excuse to get another pointless cameo in the show. So she offers Mallory the virus to genocide the soups and her reaction is, no, what the fuck is wrong with you? And the Dean leaves. This scene was a complete waste of time, and a much better idea would have been for the Dean to meet up with Billy Butcher instead of Mallory. It makes way more sense, as he has no problem killing all of the soups. She also should have been working for him, and it's through Billy that the Dean got the classified files, as he has CIA contacts. Later on, it's established that the Dean wants only Kate to survive the upcoming plague. And what exactly is her plan to do so? Stick Kate in a bubble for the rest of her life? This doesn't make any sense, but it very easily could have if Billy Butcher promised a cure for Kate by using Soldier Boy's powers, which have been proven to depower soups. This would be a much less retarded idea than what we got, but this would never happen simply because there is no way a brown woman is going to be working for a white male. So instead, we have this pointless scene between two women that accomplishes nothing. What a fucking waste of time. We then cut to Emma and Sam hiding in her dorm room, and despite the fact that Sam is still on the run and the Dean has cameras all over the building, somehow no one can find him. Christ, who wrote this? So Emma has to leave and she tells Sam to stay put, but he ends up leaving the room anyway and runs into Rufus. Now despite Rufus being a rapist, it turns out that he's a pretty nice guy as he has fun with Sam before inviting him to watch a debate about superpowers. So he can't be all bad. <laughs> the debate ends up being poorly written and stupid, but it's here where Sam learns to be a violent soup supremacist in one sitting. Wow, that's really lazy. Marie meets up with Arab AOC, and it turns out that she is her mysterious benefactor. She goes on to say that they both have the same type of bloodbending power, and because of that, they are both amazing. Pull your tongue out of my arsehole, Gary. The power to kill people in a very messy manner isn't really all that unique in this universe. So what makes her power so much better than, say, A-Train super speeds or Homelander's laser eyes? Nothing really, if anyone has any good powers, it's surely Kate, as mind control is way more useful than exploding people's heads. Of course, Arab AOC never clarifies as to why, because this scene is all about two girl bosses licking out each other's asses. 
Marie then goes on to tell Arab AOC that luckily she overheard the scientist talk about the top secret virus to himself in the dean's office for no reason. Oh, how convenient! So with that contrived bullshit over with, everyone except for Andre heads to the dean's house. Where is Andre, you ask? Well, his dad had a seizure and he went to the hospital with him. Wow, that's really... really boring. The Dean eventually arrives home and Kate gets here to confess her plans, which is to release the genocidal plague and yet somehow keep Kate alive. That's fucking stupid. Kate then gets the Dean to kill herself and there goes a pointless villain who accomplished fuck all. This is a major problem with the show, none of the villains present any sort of threat and they end up being more disposable than a tissue after a wank. She was useless. Arab AOC meets up with the scientist, and he doesn't find it suspicious at all that a random politician somehow learned that he was working on a top secret bioweapon and wants to meet all alone in a car park. Now, if he wasn't retarded, he would quickly realize how sus this whole situation is and just immediately go on the run, but unfortunately he is, and so Arab AOC kills him before taking the virus, and that's the end of episode 7. Well, that wasn't very good. Moving on to episode 8, which is just as shit as all of the others, despite having way more action in it. So it starts immediately after the killing of the Dean, with Sam and Kate leaving to go free the students held captive. The rest of the group decide to stop them, yet despite leaving the house less than a minute after Sam and Kate did, they somehow arrive at the woods long after they have freed all of the prisoners. Jesus, just how fucking slow do these people walk? Better hurry up, Mr. Tucker. I'm coming. When Kate and Sam enter the woods, they immediately start killing the guards. Seriously, how many guards does this place have? And why does anybody still work here when it's guaranteed you will die? I don't know. So after releasing the soups, they leave the building and just start murdering every non-soup they come across. In another example of bad editing, Marie, Jordan and Emma arrive at the facility after the killings have begun. So how could they not see all of the escapees running right past them on the way out? I don't know. What's interesting about the next scene is that one of the staff members has a sonic suppression device that disables soups. We even saw this back in episode 2 when one of the guards used this on Andre. So if they had this anti-soup countermeasure all along, then why the fuck did they never use this incredibly helpful device on Sam during the multiple times he escaped? Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. The writing has no consistency. One moment, they are completely helpless against the soups. The next, they have the perfect anti-soup weapon. That is how shit the writing is. But despite this being a massacre, there is still a lot of people walking around and talking about their feelings. First off is Emma, who tries to convince Sam to stop killing people, but he starts to spit out some facts. Emma, you would do anything for everyone to like you. You're not a hero. Thank you! It's funny that a mental patient has way more self-awareness than the school bicycle. So what does Emma do when confronted with the truth? Well, what she always does, which is to cry and feel sorry for herself. Only this time she has gotten really small without vomiting. And why is this now the case when she has cried many times in this show? Well, probably because the writers realise that having bulimia activate your powers is really stupid. And so they have retconned it for season 2. At the other end of town, Andre is told that his dad is suffering from brain damage, and if Andre keeps using his powers, this will eventually happen to him. There's even an example of him getting a headache after using his powers, which never happened before this scene, and it took his dad decades to develop this, but whatever. Andre's dad knows that the powers that are killing him will eventually kill his son, and so he decides to guilt trip him into taking up his superhero mantle, and this is how he rationalizes it. Our powers, they're killing. You're the big man now. Do whatever they tell you. I don't regret being able to take care of my family, and I know you're gonna do the same. That doesn't make sense. Doesn't making sacrifices for the family usually mean that you do it in order for your children not to make the same choices as you did? So why is he forcing Andre to get brain damage just like he did? I don't know. I don't know. Andre then gets a phone call from Kate to come to the school, but he doesn't want to. 
We then cut to the trio and Jordan conveniently knows that there is a panic button located in the Dean's office that will lock down the school and use the anti-soup sound suppression system to stop everyone. Why there is only one button in her room and nowhere else seems like a massive security oversight, but whatever. They manage to activate it, but it ends up being useless as one scream from a random soup breaks the only two speakers on campus. Well, that was dumb. The school executives try to flee, but their helicopter crashes. Luckily for them, Andre somehow teleports from across the city and manages to stop it. He then tries to give a gay little speech about trust to Kate, instead of just tying her up with metal and stopping this massacre. God, it's the Falcon and Winter Soldier finale all over again. Sam was not allowed to harm the female terrorist and needed another woman to do so. Just like Andre, who is a man, is not allowed to harm Kate, which is why he must wait for Marie, a woman, to do it. So because he is not allowed to harm the opposite sex, Sam then intervenes and has a fight, but his super strength seems to disappear as he punches Andre many times, leaving very little damage. The fight is pretty lackluster as Andre manages to stun him pretty easily with a nearby stun baton which renders them both unconscious. Again, if a regular baton can take out Sam, then why is he such a threat? This is a big fight between two protagonists and it's fucking shit, just like most superhero fights in the show. You could easily improve this scene by having Andre encase himself in metal like Iron Man, using the nearby Homelander statue, and the writers wouldn't have had to reduce Sam's strength. Andre could have also used the other statues to fight as puppets, but none of the writers are remotely creative and lack imagination. If you gave them a green lantern ring, the only thing they could imagine is a giant cock, because they all clearly suffer from penis envy. Marie finally shows up who has done fuck all this entire episode, and she has a girl boss scene where she skewers a man trying to kill the executives. This is not the empowering moment the writers think it is, as she is not doing anything meaningful. She hasn't overcome any sort of flaw or achieved anything of value. No, all she has done is murdered a mentally ill guy, before going on to explode Kate's arm. Now, to end all of this shit, they need a superhero to show up, and I knew they were going to throw in a last-minute meaningless cameo like they have already done many times before. But I was surprised by how the writers just gave up and shamelessly crawled back to the well by getting Anthony Starr to return as Homelander. Because you need me! The writers couldn't do it. They simply have to rely on Homelander for everything, and this proves it. Anthony Starr is on screen for less than a minute, and in that brief amount of time, he has already shown way more presence and better acting than the entire eight hours we have spent with the other characters. That is how shit they are. He ends up lasering Marie, and they awaken in a secret hospital. How did Marie survive a direct hit from Homelander when a simple knife can cut her skin? Well, the only explanation we get is from Andre. You took that blast like a fucking champ. Anyone else would be in the ground. <sighs> That's not an explanation, it's just an example of her being a Mary Sue. We then see Homelander watching the news as Vought tries to make Kate and Sam the hero of the school. But how could they possibly make that happen? If the school shooter suddenly turned up the next day as class president, surely the other students might just have a problem with it. And what about all of the relatives of the dead staff members and the multiple live streams showing the massacre? Well, don't expect an answer to all those glaring issues, because the writers are incapable and cannot be asked to answer them. The after credit scene of episode 8 is yet another meaningless cameo with Billy Butcher, because they think cameos are a substitute for good storytelling. So he goes on to say this, Oh my bunch of cunts. Ah, ah, he said it, he said it. And with that shit ending, that was Gen V. That's awful. How can a show spend 8 hours on characters and plot and yet achieve almost nothing? Gen V is style over substance in the most literal sense, as without graphic violence and several cock shots, then all it has left is a lazy contrived and dog shit script that I wouldn't even wipe my ass with. And considering that this is getting a season 2, why the fuck would the writers actually try to tell a good story when retarded shit like this sells? The only positive thing I can say about Gen V is that it gave me an insight into just how bitter and depressed the writers are as they shove their racist, creepy politics into the show at every opportunity. They have an overwhelming envy of men and are clearly mentally ill. 
Anyway, that was my review of the last two episodes of Gen V. It's a piece of shit.